welcome everybody. I'm going to divide the talk really into three parts. Um, what I'm not going to talk about is our products as such, uh, Flex and the, the, how we're addressing this issue of uh, open BIM and interoperability. Um, but what I'm going to try and do is take you through what's really been about 30 years of engagement from myself and the other members of XBIM over a duration of looking at open BIM and developing BIM software and tools and identifying kind of what we've seen as, I wouldn't say necessarily problems, but the working um, mechanics of the construction industry, which by and large is a problem for most people. Um, but I'm gonna try and highlight some of those things that are relevant to open BIM and how we see them and what, what our response to them is. Um, I fully expect that you won't all agree with me. It's my personal journey. Um, and it's my interpretation of history. Um, I'm sure we all have one, but uh, I, I just hope it's of interest to you. So I'm gonna look at the relevance and development of the foundation classes, how they got here. Uh, I'm gonna look at, at a really big level at the concepts inside IFC and how they're being used in the industry. And then I'm gonna try and consider how we go forward with interoperability and open BIM from where we are now and uh, where the industry is now. So in my personal timeline, I mean, most people will recognize Professor Chuck Eastman from Georgia Tech as, um, I think they call him the godfather of BIM. Um, but in my line, he didn't really appear until probably the late 1990s. Um, he was doing stuff in a different world from myself, perfectly valid. My world was more to do with, I was involved in sustainability energy simulation. And I worked with a great guy who's no longer with us called Godfried Algenbrau uh, from the TNO in Delft. And in my opinion, he was the person who really laid the foundations for doing some of the IFC standards that we see now. Um, what we were doing in those days was a large, so we're talking about the late 80s, mid to early 90s. And we were really concentrating on the problem of the oil crisis. If you're getting deja vu, here we are again. Um, and how the energy simulation tools that everybody had managed to develop could work with the computer-aided design tools that in those days everyone was starting to adopt. And the really big issue was um, people were drawing things in the CAD tools and modeling them. And then if they wanted to do an energy simulation, they just started again in the energy simulation tool. So effectively, we were about interoperability between CAD tools and energy simulation tools. And we were trying to come up with a common model that could be used by a range of about six or seven very dominant energy simulation tools. Uh, it was a project called Combine, um, which stands for Computer Models for the Building Industry in Europe. And it was, it was a big project by European standards. So that was funded by the EU, and it had some academics from the US on board. Mostly it was academics and um, innovators, really. It wasn't industry or anything like that. The industry sort of joined in the game. Uh, in the 1990s, and they joined alongside the academics as researchers, and they were funded by the UK and by the EU, and they started to um, try and get the, the, the modelling data in a form that was relevant to um, the construction industry in its, in its then uh, form. Um, I think it wasn't really until the end of the 1990s when the CAD and BIM vendors came on board. Um, there were some BIM vendors in the 1990s and companies like Autodesk were just starting uh, in the 2000s. Um, but when we got into the 2000s, the design of these uh, BIM models was driven by construction client demand, largely in America and largely under the behest of the um, the, the Army Corps of Engineers in America who drove out that for government um, buildings. I think they, 
I can't remember the name of the American institution, but it has more housing and building stock than anybody else in the world. And they wanted BIM models for handover, really, so that they could work with them. And during that time, two guys who I don't think get enough credit either, uh, Jeff Wicks and Nick Nisbet, started to take the work that had been done by a range of people and realize that they've got to make it into a standard or else no one would adopt it. So they started work on, it was the sort of early days of what was called the Industry Alliance for Interoperability and used to get extra points if you could say that because it's just such a mouthful. Um, but they started that and they got people on board and the big thing they realized was that the BIM tools out there, um, it was actually really hard for them to exchange data because they all used different ways of modeling geometry primarily. It wasn't so much the building model, like uh, you know, spaces, rooms, floors, walls. It was the geometry, which was was and is very complicated. And so they 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 managed to get a breakthrough by having what were called implementers agreements, where they said, "Well, this is the standard, and it's really great and complicated. This is where we're going to go, but you only have to implement this ten percent. And if you all do that, at least we'll have something working." And I've highlighted that because that kind of way of thinking about IFC now, I think, has gone. Uh, but what you have to remember is over the last 20 years, um, basically, there's, in my opinion, been a sort of a, a, not a war, but a sort of combat between BIM vendors to make their outputs more and more sophisticated and useful and complicated. And they do that largely by throwing more and more geometry forms into the models, which means that the other BIM tools who can't support those geometry models, can't read them very easily or don't do a very good job of it. So in a way, from my perspective, one of the big problems we've had has been that kind of tension between the BIM vendors and the way you read and write the IFC standard, not so much the standard itself. In 2006, the, the first um, kind of agreed version of the IFC was released, 2X3. And really, that was only used for coordination. In other words, um, taking the architects, the structural engineers, the mechanical engineers, and the electrical engineers models, and putting them together into a single view so that you could coordinate what was happening. So in sort of around 2010s and 2015s and that era, mostly it was being driven by people trying to do clash detection and coordination of designs. And again, you know, it was a new thing for the industry. They were working their way through it and it wasn't terribly easy to do, um, but they got through it. Um, and now where we are, with we've renamed the IAI to Building Smart, which is a sensible thing, I think. And we have a new standard of IFC 4X3. And what they've been doing over the last 10, 15 years is moving IFCs from really from simple buildings, well, not simple buildings, but simply buildings, to cover things like tunnels, roads, and more infrastructure types of things. And we're seeing them now in IFC 4X3, and we'll see even more of them in IFC 5, which is coming out shortly. So that's just like my kind of view of, of how the IFC got to where it is now. Um, it's relevant to open BIM. Um, as I said, this is a very mixed audience. So I've tried to kind of um, see this open BIM world through two eyes, because you've got an audience of you out there that come from the AEC sector, and you're either designing, procuring, or constructing buildings, or you're managing them as an asset. And we've got now an increasing number of software vendors who want to get in to doing BIM, and to bring BIM into their world. So, I mean, in a way, this talk should be done differently for each set of people. So forgive me, I'm gonna try and cover both in one talk, uh, which means I, I can't, you might be glad to, to know, go into great detail about the technicalities of IFC. Um, so if we look at it from the perspective of the AEC companies, you'll find that mostly out there now, what it's being used for is design collaboration and coordination. So the picture on the right hand side there, that lovely picture, um, which, uh, you know, it's an aspiration for all of us of all the different disciplines in the construction sector sitting around a table 
throwing their models to each other and exchanging data and working concurrently is is the vision and coordinating what they do um i'm going to leave it to you to judge how near we are to that um but the main problem that i see for us out there at the moment is that most of this exchange and communication is one directional it, it what i mean by that is the big bim tools and even the small bim tools can transmit ifc data but very few of them effectively can be relied on to read it well uh, they can only read it well if you restrict what you export to them and you understand their limitations and work around it every year goes by they get better but it's taking a long time for them to be able to import reliably even their own exports so um, i find that a bit strange but it's to do with the fact largely that the, the ifc is and buildings are complex and it's easy to transmit what you know it's difficult to read things that you've never seen before or don't understand or can't handle um in my opinion the most useful use of ifc at, at this moment in time is for handover models and documentation um, but what we're finding is when we talk to people in the sector um I say clients who are due to receive these models, there are now a growing number of large clients who are saying they want them. Um, but then when they get them, they're not entirely sure what to do with them. Um, and they don't often have the business processes in place to actually take real advantage of them. And it's frustrating for people like myself and some of you out there that they just don't seem to be able to get this um, and, and really provide a, a poll for it and as a result it's very difficult to get them on a large scale to pay for that service so therefore it becomes difficult for people to want to deliver it um a short story about one large company i work with uh, they they actually built huge buildings and they handed them over to their own company which was specializing in facilities management of the buildings that they had designed and built and they couldn't get their own company to accept their BIM models, because I'm going back probably seven years. They couldn't get their own company to accept the BIM models to, to manage the facility for one or two years while it was sort of got through all the teething problems. They, they Their own company actually just redrew everything when, when they got it. So it's, it's I don't know, probably a process that's getting better and we've got better standards now and they're improving, but I don't see it I don't see it really flying at the moment and, and it should i think um from the software vendors point of view what we see from our toolkit use and our um, people who've adopted the platform is the the whole issue of 3d visualization and geometry and ifc is about as sophisticated as it comes and for everyone to try and implement tools that can deal with that is ridiculous um and it's time consuming and fraught with complexity and risk. Um, so, you know, there is, and that's one of the drivers that we've addressed in Flex is the ability to shrink that, that whole activity for people. Um, but it, it's a barrier for software vendors to get in, but, but they actually do want it in their model. They want to see the 3D of the building in there. And that's what they're trying to get. Um, whereas, what would be really useful is getting the data out of the BIM model so that they can take it to another level. Um, and that's still, I think it's it's there in some models, it's there in some of the smaller tools that they're, they're taking advantage of that. Um, but by and large, the third party BIM tools uh, don't have support for round tripping. So it's a problem for the software developers. They can take stuff in, but when they come to give it back out to the, um, to the other BIM tools and the design team, it, it doesn't, So that's, I think, where I see it, just as a very quick overview. I'm going to go into some more detail about those things in the next part. But I, from my perspective, Open BIM has been kind of pushed more as a way of working and thinking. Um, it's almost a process for doing a project. And um, I'm going to challenge that in a bit as we go through. Um, it's largely from, from the people in the industry out there they see it as configuring proprietary tools to interoperate quite often. Um, and that is a, an aspect of open BIM. And often that set of proprietary tools is one tool for everybody. 
um, you know, sometimes it's easier to get them to retrain their staff to use a different software tool than it is to interoperate between commercial BIM tools. Um, what I do firmly believe is that IFC is a very strong and durable format, and it's it is very suitable for open BIM exchanges. And I hope in the rest of this talk, I'm going to get you to believe that as well. There. Okay, so looking at the concepts in IFC, um, if we just start from the very top level and looking at what IFC is, um, this is the common diagram you see in all of the models. And I've only put this up not to explain it to you, but just to show you the sheer breadth and scope of what an IFC model can contain. So, I mean, if you're looking along the top there, you can see it's covering building controls, electrical domain, HVAC domain, ports and waterways. It's it's really large in its scope. And the resources down the bottom um, are, you know, everything you could think of, really, from geometry to quantification to actors and documents. Um, the In general, looking at this level, these four uh, levels of, of uh, implementation here, the bottom level, I think, is relatively stable, and you, by and large, it's used by all the ones based largely on pretty good standards. And the only one that I see evolving a lot is property definitions. Um, and the top level is also pretty stable. That's all the products in, in the model. So at this level here, all of those there are you know they, they're getting extended but they don't change an awful lot they're pretty stable and they're very comprehensive in scope if we look at geometry down here geometry is also pretty stable and um, quite comprehensive and processes are here i'm going to i'm going to talk about these in some more technical detail as we go through i just want to give you an overview and materials uh, are part of this and documents are part of this external re references and properties are here so this gives you an idea of the big chunks this is how i'm going to look at the ifc and try and explain um, how we see it and how we're working with it so if you look at products they are what you'd expect so this is really for those who are from the university just coming in and wondering you know what these are i'm sure some of you out there perfectly know this um, but a product uh, is exactly what you think it is. It's a physical thing. It has a shape. Uh, in IFC, it has a global identifier, so you can reference it between database systems and outside of the actual IFC uh, data file. It's globally identifiable. It has a physical location in space, and it has a set of properties that define it. Um, they are almost totally defined by the user. I'll come on to that. And it has relationships with other objects and it can have a type. So for instance, you can see over there, we've got a site, a building, a building story and a space. Um, you know, a site contains many buildings. There's the relationships. Um, a building can contain spaces, another relationship there. Um, a space might be um, circulation space, that's a type. Um, a wall might be a uh, you know, 300 mil cavity wall with insulation, that's the type. Um, beams, doors, windows, and they will all have properties like door width, door height, um, and they'll all have identifiers. So that just gives you, you know, that's that's the bit that is pretty stable and pretty well understood in IFCs and has been since probably 2000 and well, just after 2000, I think, really. Geometry is the one that terrifies everyone, and I hear loads of calls for simplifying geometry. Um, but the thing about geometry is, is it has really good standard support behind it. It's based on the shoulders of giants, as they say. So that complicated diagram on the left is not from construction. It's from it's from engineering disciplines. And they've been wrestling with this problem for probably twice as long as we have in construction. And they've gone through all of these things and, and standardized them. So they've got standards for 3D scanning, for uh, 2D drafting for product manufacturer information. Uh, I'm told that these standards, when you print them out and stand them up, are about four meters high in, in paper. So this is a lot of work here. And 
the important thing to remember is all all the geometry and a lot of the thinking in IFC is based upon these standards, which are called part of uh, ISO 10303. And um, people often refer to it as the STEP standard, which is the standard for the exchange of product data. And that's being driven by the air, aircraft industry, oil industry, gas sector. It's, it's not driven by construction. Um, and it has a proven usage, I would suggest. Um, IFC, as far as I can tell, geometry is my area. And as far as I can tell, uh, IFC just about does every form of geometry you can think of. Uh, they're adding a few more at the moment, but it's um, for, to deal with uh, linear um, things like railways and highways, but th they're all there and it's very, very easily extended. Um, so I don't think you can go far beyond it for comprehensiveness. As I mentioned earlier, for BIM vendors, exporting IFG geometry is easy. So if you've only got um, an ex a, a model that works on extrusions, such as something like Tecla structural product, which is basically all extrusions and CSGs, um, then you can just export extrusions and CSGs. You don't have to bother with all the other things, um, not necessarily. Um, but if your internal uh, representation uh, doesn't support a geometry that's in IFC, like a BREP or an, a, a spline, then you can't really import it into your model because you've got no support for the complexity of that geometry. And you've got to simplify it and change it to something that maybe looks the same but isn't actually the same. Um, a common one we find is that things get turned into triangles because everything can read triangles, but it's a nonsense thing to do in terms of uh, if you want to do, um, if you want to use design, use it in a design tool because you can't really change the shapes once they come in, they're just triangles. Um, and this bit at the bottom gives you an idea I've put the views here because I think views are most relevant to geometry. Um, they affect all um, all objects in the BIM model, but a view in IFC is an agreed sort of set of things you're going to use and how you're going to use them. So there's a view for coordination that says, well, you won't use this geometry form and you will always have a project and you will always have a building and a site. So it, it determines what's got to be in there. Um, that's that's the longest one that's been out there for since 2006. The design transfer view and the reference view came with IFC4, and they are literally design transfer is if I want to send you a beam, then I need to send it as an extrusion because when you get a beam, you might want to change its length and extrude it along a different distance. So as opposed to if I send you it as triangles then you can't do anything with it. It's just, it looks like the beam that was in the other model and that's great. So the triangle view is used in the reference uh, view. The reference is you can't change it, you can't do anything with it, you can only see it, it's stable and you can attach data to it, but no one can then uh, go on and edit it and do anything really sensible with it. And the driver between those two views is largely how much of your intellectual property you want to hand over when you exchange a model. So if, you, if you're willing to pass some of the design responsibility onto another person, use the design transfer view. But if you don't want them to change anything you've done and you just want them to reference your data and draw over it, in example, then you send a reference view. Most people seem to be sending coordination views. And I think that's the default in a lot of the BIM tools. So I can do this one really quickly. Um, some of you out there might actually have worked with the process model in IFC. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, in my opinion, but I rarely see it occurring. And a lot of it is because, well, as the, as the meme says there, you know, if you're going to define a process, you've got to know what you're doing in the first place. And a lot of the, we don't have that rigor in construction for, for you know, we might, we might have um, project plans and milestones and Gantt charts, but it's nothing like the manufacturing process or anything that's really rigorous. It's, it's more a way of monitoring and sort of scheduling things and adapting as things go right or wrong as we go along. But IFC can support it. And there are some specialist BIM tools that do use it. You quite often see it in 4D and 5D where they want to say, 
not just simulate, um, not just show you a bridge, but simulate the construction of the bridge as, as all the parts go together. It's quite useful for that. Uh, materials are my, I uh, don't know, I'm not going to say that word. Um, materials, it's, it always struck me as strange, it's probably the one the most important thing in a building is what it's made of. And yet in IFC, a material at best has a name. Sometimes you might get a description and a category, and that's about it really. Um, and there is not much in the way of standards around materials so and we don't really adopt an awful lot of standards for material databases so you kind of find you'll get a name in one model called um arab steel and in another model it might be uh, kujar's steel they tend to just name it however they want and if you want to try and coordinate the materials say so gather all the steel materials together it's sort of an exercise in um it's an exercise in string parsing and seeing what words are in there um i'm sure it could be improved if the industry standardized the way it described materials um but uh, i don't see anything on that front at the moment particularly strong out there that people are using so materials are really important if you want to do a quantity takeoff. They're really important if you want to do embodied carbon. Um, and getting them set out as standards with naming conventions and agreed classifications would be immensely useful for the industry. But that's to come, I think. They can support properties, but you rarely find them in there. And there are an unlimited number of properties they can have. And you can't just give something a value and call it a property. You've got to let people know how you measure, what measurement system that property was done to, um, what units it was used in, um, and under what conditions, temperature, whatever. So it's they are a complex thing. And at the moment, we're just exchanging names by and large. Documents. Uh, I. I mean, we in Flex heavily use documents because we're targeting, initially we targeted asset management and documents and asset management go very closely together. So documents are really useful for handover documentation, for product specification, and just adding data that is uh, already out there in a, an external resource. Uh, I think the document model is fine, it's ready, uh, but rarely do you see any of the main BIM tools using it. I don't think you can attach documents in an IFC file when you export from a tool like Revit. Um, we see it where people are using Kobe, um, and I'm sure you'll all have your, your views on that um, and the complexity of dealing with it. As I said, we do widely use documents, but um, definitely an area that's got a lot, a lot of uh, mileage for people to work with. Finally, properties. Um, the IFC has nearly a thousand entity definitions, classes in it, and it has thousands of properties defined in the schema. It's not short of them. Um, and they tend to come in sets um, by type. So you get a set of properties for a beam, a set of properties for a wall. Um, you might not want them all, you might just choose two or three. Um, but there's literally hundreds of organizations out there who are working to try and standardize the properties of products. And um, it would be very interesting to hear where those things are now, how they, how much penetration they're having in the sector. Um, but it's another thing like materials. You've got to agree them up front what you're going to use if you're going to interoperate with properties. They've got to be, you know, um, they've got to be part at the start of the project and the one's got to say what they're going to use and the the difficulty i find is that a lot of the design organizations have created their own bim libraries they're also using third-party bim libraries um and there's a sort of an effort to standardize but the naming of the properties and what they are is is quite uh, uncontrolled out there so what you often find is that companies when they export the IFC file, um, they'll take all the properties out of the BIM model because they can't guarantee what they are. They're not, they're not sure that the property that's gone out is actually right for that object in this context. 
and they haven't got time to QA them all and check them all because there's lots of them. So it's just so fail safe for your uh, quality control is just remove them, which, you know, it's a bit a bit of a challenge if that's the the eye in BIM as the information. Um, and the BIM vendors tend to leave it largely to the user. So you can define your own properties in the BIM tool. You can map them to things. It's down to you to decide what you want to do with them. So there's no real rigor about properties. It's a, it's a mechanism that we can use. Um, but if you want to hand over a building, maintain and operate it, you know, you've got to have these properties sorted out so that people can have a shared understanding of them. And the last line there is bad data is worse than no data is really what I'm saying about stripping things out. If you send someone um, a door and the property defining its width isn't the same as the actual width of the door, that can cause you all kinds of difficulties down line. And that can happen. So a question we have to ask ourselves is, is interoperability? Because for a lot of people, it's just sharing a bin between two or more tools. Essentially, that's that's the, that's the sort of simplistic view of it. Um, and we've had, you know, we've had standards like BS 1192 and the ISO standard equivalent now. And um, I, I decided for this talk to try and find out, because in my honest opinion, construction's rubbish at coming up with a sound theory base for things. They normally steal them from other sectors. And, and adapt them to theirs. So we've adapted IFC is from the aircraft industry. And when I was looking around for people with sectors out there that had really sort of had a go at what interoperability was, the one that came out highest was the health service. And the, the reason for that is that they've got, if you think about their data, they've got some serious problems in moving the whole of the health service forward to having proper interoperability but for all of the health service computers and medical records <clears throat> so they they actually um have defined four levels of interoperability and i think in our first pass of 1192 we we had four levels as well level zero one two and three um and i think level zero was um I think you were just sharing a file and level one was you agreed a naming convention for the file and level two was you used some kind of agreed standards and then three was you know the top of the tree and we never got to level three I don't think anyone got to level three and some people got to level two but most people were struggling to go from one to two really so I just thought I would take a retrospective look using their definitions of what these various levels are and look at the construction industry and see how we um how far we've got through doing these things and i had quite a surprise um when i was doing this so if you look at found what they call foundational interoperability their definition is that you establish interconnectivity requirements for one application to communicate data and receive data from another now, the way the construction industry has done that is that they've agreed they're going to have a common data environment or even a shared drive. And, you know, it might be as simple as just sharing PDFs. It might be just sharing drawings and reusing them and spreadsheets in certain formats. That is very, very widely used in the construction industry now. And probably the default mode of people working on projects uh, that are not massive, for instance, you know, the normal kind of small to medium sized project. And I think we can say that most of construction has achieved foundational interoperability. They've got a foundation for doing it. Um, and that is, I think, in our old terms, that's BIM level zero stroke one. It's somewhere between the two. Structural interoperability is where the format syntax and organization of the data exchange is defined at the level of data fields. So it's codification, which I think we've been wrestling with for 10 or more years now, where you have something like there on the right, where you take a big string, you chop it up into 10 pieces, and you allocate one of those pieces to some particular meaningful thing. So on, on there, if you saw, what have we got? Um, a, 
is for architect. I don't know what M3 is, V1. These are ones we really use in the industry. I, I don't know where PR M3 is, is program. Pardon? M3 is model. It's model. It's model in three. Okay, right. So um, we, we've definitely got that going on there, and that's defined in those standards. Um, and we also are saying that there are certain fields that must be there. So you've got to provide a project name and you've got to provide coordinates. Um, all levels will be codified so that you can guess what they are. And classification codes are optional, but if you're going to use them, they should be Uniclass 2015. So we, we've got that kind of structural level working there. And I think a lot of the leading edge sensible companies working on large, medium to large projects, you can see them doing this kind of thing now. I certainly get a lot of these names flying past inside BIM models with large codification things in there. Um, and arguably that's BIM level two, um, not quite all the way. The third level is semantic level. So as you can see from the diagram, it's where you agree on what a concept is. So you could have two people there who, given the concept of crane, have completely different ideas about what a crane is. And that is to be avoided at all costs. So for this, you need a common underlying model and you need codification of data um, and you need standards and you need to have a shared understanding of what those standards are between users. So if I send you a wall, you understand what a wall is. And this may seem really simple, but when you start thinking about walls, uh, I'll give you an example of one thing I banged into doing a Durham Cathedral model. Um, walls in most of the BIM tools have to be vertical. And I think one of the walls in the Durham Cathedral was, I don't know, 80 degrees off, off the ground, leaning, and you couldn't model it as a wall. So you had to end up modeling it as something else completely different. And when you start getting into those concepts and you're trying to exchange the concept that this is a wall, but you can't because the BIM tool won't let you because it's not vertical, um, you get into problems. And that's an extreme example, but there are loads of things like that. So for instance, if you're looking at say a popular tool like Revit and say Archicad, and you say, is the concept of a building in Revit the same as a concept of a building in Archicad? The answer is there is no concept of a building in Revit. So you're a bit stuck. It doesn't have a building in its model. Um, it makes one up when you export it to IFC, but it fundamentally isn't in the uh, model inside Revit, which is rather odd. Um, and if you say something like the height of a room, is it the same as the height of a space? I mean, what you're seeing there is that some tools regard things as spaces. Some tools regard them as rooms. Some people do a difference between space and room. A space is a mechanical thing and a room is an architectural thing. And height can be measured to the underside of the ceiling or the underside of the floor. If you don't agree these concepts, then you can't exchange them semantically in a way where the recipient can do something reliably with it in a workflow scenario, because they're going to be constantly wondering, well, what is that height? Uh, do I have to add the ceiling void onto it? Um, so the, the, the thing is that all the underlying models of the current BIM tools internally are different. Um, and the only common underlying model that I can see out there at the moment is IFC. I don't see any competitor. Um, it is the only building information model that is shared, it's understood, it's standardized, and you can exchange data between it. Um, so I'm raising the question really is uh, IFC is the vehicle for semantic data exchange. So if you want to get to this level, which is level three data exchange, um, getting, getting towards level three, I think you've got to use IFC. When we get to the top level, which is organizational interoperability, then things get a little complicated. Um, and what it says here is you need governance and policies to facilitate the secure, seamless and timely communication and use of data between organizations and individuals. So if you imagine in the health service context, they send the medical records from one GP to a doctor in the hospital. You don't want some misunderstanding about what a drug is and what the dose of the drug is that they've received 
and you know what what their uh, existing conditions are they've got to be they've got to be agreed or otherwise you could get real problems and it's just the same in construction so we have national policies and international to some extent so we've got the iso 19650 um but the rather strange thing is that um for the uk people um there's an appendix at the end of there that basically says um you don't really have to use a particular uh, common underlying data model. So you don't have to necessarily do the previous step. You can use sim simpler things if you want. So I find that a bit odd, really, that that we, you know, there is a clear reason for this hierarchy that I've just walked you through the four levels. But when we get to this level and it starts to get a bit hard, they they they, they back off on requiring people to exchange data in a common format and allow them to use other means of doing it. And I think that's just pragmatism, but um, going forward, I think as, a, as an industry, we have to kind of address it. Um, what we tend to do is have project policies that we set up, which deal with things like timing of exchanges, responsibilities, and we have governance at a project level, which is now called an information manager, I believe. Um, and that governance is project specific. So we don't have, um, we have organizational level exchange, but it's agreed on a per project basis, which reflects the nature of the industry. It doesn't, it's not, if you go and work with somebody else in another organization, you've got to retrain them to your method of working or realign them to it. And that's a problem, I think. Um, so what we're looking for is things that are, it should be enabled to share consent, trust, and, and it should be able to be integrated in end user processes. So I shouldn't, the end user shouldn't have to start editing the data I send them in order to import it into one of the processes and execute a workflow on it. Uh, it should, they should be able to rely on the data being correctly formatted and modeled. Um, and, and that is for me, what true open BIM is. That, that's where I think we have to go eventually. Um, that's where I think we'll get real benefit. And I think if you bring in the concept of cloud-based BIM, it's got to be about exchanging data and not files. We've got to move out of that way of, of working. And the new sets of databases that are coming out there now are object-based and you are exchanging objects in a building, not a drawing or a model of a building, a whole model. And I think that's that's the line we've taken with Flex, and that's that's what we support. And the question is, is the industry capable of turning in any kind of time scale to be able to work that way? Because it will require major changes. My hunch is that there'll be some few number of really clever companies who get their head around this and kind of take a large number of the large sector of the market. And the rest of the sector just will stay doing small works and medium-sized projects. So just to conclude, and then we can open it up to any questions if you have any, um, this is just about what we've been doing. And we started five years ago on Flex addressing these problems. And we started with an open BIM frame of mind from the bottom, right from the start. So the whole software platform, it, it is a cloud platform is ground up open BIM. Uh, it's also open standards, open APIs, and it's cloud-based by design. So we we started to build it as a cloud-based app. It's not been retro pushed into a cloud-based app. Um, it is built on our open source toolkit um, because of the robustness and reliability and the fact that that's been used in hundreds of serious products and has well, thousands of hours of testing in it. So we, we built it on top of that. Um, it's workflow centric. So it's all about automating um, BIM activities by exchanging uh, models on parts of models and building your own workflows. So you can build your own workflows into it. Want to do. It's not building oriented, it's asset and portfolio oriented. And fundamentally, it's conceptually aligned to Kobe, even though it's totally IFC implemented. So it's implementing the effectively the IFC uh, handover model definition. Um, 
and it's simplifying industry standards. That's what we try to do is to make them things simpler for people. Um, it's enterprise ready. It's, it can be deployed anywhere around the world in any data center, uh, giving us good support for data and governance. And our customers, one of the things we found is that's a really important thing with sharing models is data governance and legal jurisdiction. And it's, if you're going to do anything like this, it's essential that you can deploy your uh, data storage to a place and know what the, the, the legal governance of that place is. Um, so you can't, for instance, host um, data from Saudi Arabia or some of the other countries. You've got to put them in places where they respect their, their governance. So finally, that what we're trying to do is power digital twins. We are not a digital twin. We, we are a platform that lets you build tools that do digital twin applications. And we don't want to be a digital twin. We are a, an enabler, as is the toolkit. We're not a solution. We're, a, we're targeted at software developers who want to develop and innovate new solutions.